Maryland is recognized for one hour. Madam Speaker, for the purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Oklahoma, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purposes of debate only. I ask unanimous consent that all members be given five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. That objection. Madam Speaker, on Tuesday, the Rules Committee met and reported a rule, House Resolution 43, providing for consideration of H.R. 268, making supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019, and for other purposes. The rule provides for consideration of the legislation under a structured rule. The rule makes in order 15 amendments for members on both sides of the aisle. The rule provides for one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. The rule also waives the requirement for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee on Rules on the same date as presented to the House with respect to any resolution reported through the legislative day of January 23rd <clears throat> relating to a measure making or continuing appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019. I rise now in support of the rule for H.R. 268, our emergency disaster relief bill to provide $12.14 billion in recovery and relief assistance for millions of Americans suffering from the damage caused by recent hurricanes, typhoons, mudslides, flooding, earthquakes, and wildfires. These natural disasters follow decades of scientific warnings to Congress that accelerating climate change would bring us extreme weather events characterized by unprecedented ferocity and violence. And here we are now in the middle of the global crisis of climate change, dealing with, a prof with profound natural catastrophes like these. Last year, Hurricane Michael, the most intense hurricane ever to strike the Florida panhandle, brought winds surpassing 125 miles per hour and gusts of up to 200 miles per hour, killing 45 people who were crushed and drowned by the hurricane and inflicting $40 billion in economic damages and $5 billion in insured losses. In 2018, the people of California, who have lost 10 million acres of forest in the last decade to wildfire, experienced the deadliest and most destructive wildfire season in recorded history, with more than 8,500 fires burning an area of 1,893,913 acres, the largest area of burned acreage ever recorded in a fire season in the United States of America. An astonishing 7,100 structures burned to the ground. In July and August, it seemed like the entire state was ablaze with the worst damage taking place in Northern California, which was declared a disaster area. Millions of people in San Francisco and the Bay Area were forced to wear gas masks to go to school or to go to work. In November, yet another round of wildfires visited massive destruction of life, limb, and property on the people of California. One fire, the so-called Camp Fire, displaced tens of thousands of people and killed at least 86 men, women, and children, burning many of them to death in their cars or as they sought refuge and tried to flee from their cars and ran down the road. The fire, which lasted many days, annihilated more than 18,000 structures and buildings and destroyed the entire town of Paradise, turning it into an, an inferno, a hell on earth. This was in our country. The same kinds of astonishing events that destroyed entire communities in Florida and in California were experienced by people all over America last year. Hurricane devastation in Puerto Rico, Texas, and the Carolinas, unprecedented flooding and drought all over America, typhoons in the territories, a catalog of climate change intensified misery and suffering that the entire Congress should see as calling upon the decency and resources of the American people to address. The $12 billion legislation the majority brings forward today in H.R. 268 will ensure that communities across the land can recover from these disasters with the resources that they need to rebuild. The bill helps farmers suffering from crop and livestock losses, coastal communities rebuilding their infrastructure and preparing to weather future storms, dislocated workers, veterans, students, and other Americans displaced and uprooted by these catastrophes. 
The bill invests in restoration of disaster, disaster damaged forests. It sends aid to states and local communities to restore more than 250,000 acres of watershed. It funds restoration of rural communities. It offers $600 million to continue disaster nutrition benefits to the hard hit people of Puerto Rico, still reeling from Hurricane Maria. And it allocates critical funding for social services, mental health, education, nutrition ass assistance, and in infrastructure resiliency in communities across the land. We will rebuild our transportation systems with this legislation. We will repair housing. We will repair businesses and public infrastructure. We will repair and reconstruct hurricane-damaged Veterans Administration and Department of Defense bases and facilities across the country. But the majority is not stopping there. We're not just offering aid to states and local communities across the land to rebuild and renew. We are reopening the government of the United States so we can actually send this aid, so we can offer the expert technical assistance these communities need, and so we can use the full apparatus of our government, including the currently closed down Department of Homeland Security and the Coast Guard where our hardworking personnel are not being paid uh, to get America moving again. The National Governors Association, a bipartisan group of, government, of governors from the 50 states, called for an immediate reopening of the government that will allow for the release of $85 billion in federal aid and loan assistance that is being held up because a third of the government has been shut down. That is the governors of our states, the people closest to surveying the damage on the ground. Indeed, by reopening the government of the United States of America, we're not just helping to address the disasters that have befallen our people across the country. We are ending the man-made disaster of the government shutdown. And when I say it's man-made, I don't mean to use archaic sexist language, Madam Speaker. I am trying to be precise. This is the shutdown that one man, President Donald Trump, gave us and proudly claimed as his own in the December 11th White House meeting when he said, quote, I am proud to shut down the government, Chuck. I will take the mantle. I will be the one to shut it down, said the President of the United States. I'm not going to blame you for it. So far, this shutdown that the President is proud to have delivered to his people has closed nine federal departments, state, agriculture, interior, commerce, justice, homeland security, treasury, um, and HUD and transportation. It has caused 800,000 federal workers to be furloughed or compelled to work with no pay at all. It has threatened public safety in national parks, which are overflowing with garbage and backed up waste in the bathrooms. It has threatened the tax refund of millions of Americans. It's threatened 38 million low-income Americans who depend on SNAP benefits for proper nutrition for their families. And it has unleashed profound chaos and anxiety in the land. In my congressional district, tens of thousands of federal workers have been denied pay. Air traffic controllers, Coast Guard personnel, NIH researchers, scientists at NOAA. I have heard from scientists at FDA who have been furloughed and prevented from working on the prevention and containment of E. coli, salmonella, and insect infestation of our food supply. I have spoken to an Army veteran who has spent the rest of his career after leaving the Army as an air traffic controller, who now must raid his own retirement plan and his daughter's 529 college plan, plan with a 10% penalty in order to pay his mortgage. I have spoken to several constituents who have been forced to pay their mortgages with credit cards or loans from other family members, and I have talked to constituents who've been forced to forego medical treatments because they can't balance their checkbooks when they're ordered to work but receive a pay stub, like many have emailed to me, showing zero net pay, zero gross pay, and hundreds of thousands of people who work for private contractors and small businesses working with the government across America have been injured as well. Many furloughed, laid off, or fired with no real promise of making their money back, unlike the federal workers 
um, who, at least I hope, should be getting their money back because of legislation that the majority has brought forward. But the 172,000 federal workers in my state are losing $778 million every two weeks, and the state has already lost more than $60 million in taxes. The economic reverberations are awful, and they are spreading. Now, this shutdown is a brutal assault on the separation of powers and the Constitution of the United States. It does not form a more perfect union. It does not establish justice. It shuts the Justice Department down. It does not ensure domestic tranquility. It defunds the Department of Homeland Security. It does not provide for the common defense, but it robs our Coast Guard personnel of their paychecks. It does not promote the general welfare, but it furloughs food inspectors. It cheats civil servants out of their salaries. It promotes tax fraud by locking IRS agents out of their offices. And it idles environmental scientists, diplomats, air traffic controllers, and TSA agents who are calling in sick because they can't even afford to get to work now. This policy is not in service of we the people. And that is why every public opinion poll shows the American people overwhelming overwhelmingly rejecting the Trump shutdown, this scandalous assault on the public good. In America, we don't hold the government or the workforce or the people hostage over a policy dispute. That's an absolute betrayal of the separation of powers and how government is supposed to work in the United States of America. Now, my good friends across the aisle um, should be confronting the shutdown with us. We are asking them to join us in getting the emergency aid to our people all across the land and in reopening the government. I know it wasn't their idea, Madam Speaker. I know they were backed into this situation by President Trump and Fox News and Ann Coulter, who the president apparently saw on TV and then changed his mind and decided to shut the government down. But now I'm afraid that our friends across the aisle have become enablers of the president. And now they own a piece of the shutdown. The party of Abraham Lincoln, <clears throat> who saved the union with malice for none and charity for all, has become the party of Donald Trump, who shut down the government with charity for none and malice for all. Let's put an end to it right now, Madam Speaker. In the age of climate change, we have no time left for these foolish and self-destructive games. We must act as first responders for the American people and our new majority in the House of Representatives is up to the task. We are ready to govern. We are ready to lead. Let's help our people recover from the natural disasters which have been exacerbated by climate change. And let's end the man-made disaster of the shutdown of our own government right now. Right now. Americans know the truth of this situation. Let's act together to end the Trump shutdown, which the American people rightfully despise and deplore. Let's put the government back to work for the general welfare starting with the millions of Americans still buffeted by the terrifying weather calamities of 2018. Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time.